Welcome, everybody, to, um, to the uh, staff tour uh, for the exhibition beginning with the 70s radial change. The um, overall, the exhibition focuses on the process of creating an archive through the creation of new works. And uh, for this exhibition, uh, it combines two new commissions, um, works from the Belkin Permanent Collection, and then a, a lovely moment where an artist in the community heard about the development of the exhibition and came forward with a series of photographs um, that had not ever been presented. So we were able to um, support the production of these works and include them in the exhibition. Um, Radial Change is taken from the title of a dance work by Helen Goodwin. And uh, Helen was um, lived between 1927 and 1985. She was a choreographer and dancer. She was British born and uh, trained with Laban on the, in the United Kingdom. She taught at the University of BC in, uh, she taught in physical education and theater uh, because there was no, and continues to not have, <laughs> UBC continues to not have a dance program. Uh, while she was at UBC, she formed uh, or founded a theater company called Box 80, um, which was essentially a dance company, and it was sometimes ab abbreviated to The Company or The Co. The dance company was closely associated with Intermedia Society, which was co-founded in 1967 by Goodwin. And uh, together with a group of visual artists, musicians, poets, dancers, architects, academics, and filmmakers, uh, as well as scientists, actually. Uh, Intermedia was awarded the first Canada Council for the Arts grant for an artist run center. Uh, receiving at that time a monumental sum of $40,000 for annual programming. She was a, a central influencer in the interdisciplinary program of Intermedia Society and uh, she kind of advocated for a live art focus. You can really see that kind of British influence and their way of thinking about live arts. Um, and the in that dance practice within the context of intermedia, which was looking at resituating the body as an ideal medium for depicting movement within visual art. So this kind of work was groundbreaking uh, work and foundational for what we think of now as performance art in Canada. So that's a little bit about Helen Goodwin and um, the idea of the title of radial change was thinking about this notion of radius, the notion of an artistic circle, and this idea of how Helen Goodwin, who was once at the kind of center of this community, over time slipped from the center to becoming toward the margin, to the point where prior to this exhibition, not very much of her work exists in any archive at all. Uh, not much was really known about her. So the process of the two commissions, one by Evan Siebens, which is in the other room, and one by Michael de Courcy uh, in this area here, um, part of the process of making the, the work is accumulating information and building an archive about this presence, who was, at, as I said, was went to the kind of center, moved in the margin into a certain level of obscurity, and now hopefully we're pulling her back into the center. Um, yeah, so let's begin in the next room. Cherry Picker is not part of the exhibition. Uh, so this room, this configuration of the gallery um, is unusual to have it divided into roughly three triangles but um, I think it works really well in this context. Uh, the works in this room are all from the Belkin collection, uh, per the permanent art collection and the archives. So this uh, huge 
red dress is uh, from, originally the work was done in 1957. It's at Suko Tanaka. Uh, and this was a costume for a performance that uh, she did originally in 1957 and then reconstructed in 2004. Uh, Tanaka is a core member of Gatai, Japanese avant-garde artist collective, um, whose members created experimental artworks, um, often involving performance. Um, so she, with this work and with other works, she used specially constructed costumes, uh, trick sleeves, and detachable panels to reveal additional layers. So it was uh, quite a um, uh, acrobatic performance that she did within this enormous red dress. Um, and once the piece was recreated by the Belkin for a retrospective show, which happened here in 2005, um, we kept the reconstructed dress um, within our archive. So many of the works in the exhibition are costumes, props, or the debris or detritus left over from, um, from performance works that have happened here at the Belkin over the years. Uh, so for instance, this work is um, called Red Carpet, and it's uh, Rosa Maria Robles, who's a Mexican artist, born in 1963. Um, Red Carpet uh, was a performance piece that was um, uh, presented in the exhibition Broken Borders, which was curated by a, a CCST student from UBC, uh, Adriana Estrada Centelles. And uh, what the, we're looking at um, are the materials that were left over from a performance that happened at the Belkin Satellite, um, where the artist uh, spread these blankets in a kind of a pathway um, and then extracted her own blood into this bag and bowl, uh, and the blood was distributed over the blankets. The reference here uh, has to do with um, these kinds of blankets, each of which refer to a particular part of um, the drug cartels in Mexico. Uh, they are the blankets that were um, ordinarily used to uh, wrap a body uh, when it was discarded, a, a murder victim, uh, and would uh, signal um, that this was activity of a particular gang. Um, so Robles was using this um, idea of kind of a, a religiosity around this idea of self-sacrifice to also comment um, and, and the use of um, kind of shock value and body fluids within performance art and simultaneously referencing uh, the conditions of, of uh, crime and violence within Mexico. Um, it, it's sitting next to this work here on the wall, which is the Angel of Independence from the, this series called Rebellion of Icons. And in this uh, piece, she's standing in as this kind of contemporary embodiment of uh, the Mexican Monument of Independence. Uh, so she has painted herself out in gold. You'll see she's also draped in one of these um, crime scene blankets, uh, holding a bag of drugs and a, and a gun um, in the place of, uh, of Victory's left hand or the broken chains. So the other element in this, this self-portrait are emu feathers, which were, are another kind of contraband that are very popular uh, form of exchange between the um, Mexican underworld. This is a work by Joyce Leland. It's a lithograph, and uh, it's in many collections across Canada. Um, it's a lithograph on silk, and in order to make the work, Joyce um, wore really bright red lipstick. She sang the national anthem while pressing her lips to the lithographic stone. 
so you can see the national anthem being played out over this like rough grid. Um, so as a kind of a bodily trace, I think within this room, we can see a number of examples of uh, the body and uh, what is coming off the body or left behind uh, from the body as this uh, trace of a performance. And um, I think in this work and in uh, Carolee Schneeman's work, uh, are good examples of this. So, uh, Carly Schneeman is a performance artist known for uh, some of the work uh, that uses, thank you, Sorry. uses her um, own body, um, often kind of covered with materials and in an environment, uh, a, very, a very important work, one work called Meat Joy where she is sort of swinging within a space covered in pig's blood um, and in this kind of like gleeful, playful, rolling around in matter, um, just takes this idea of the female body as over-identified with sexuality and uh, just like pushes it to the extreme. Um, this piece is a unique print uh, from an edition of two um, and it uses appropriated images from art history as well as prints that she made from her own body. Um, she's, it's called Vulva Studies Freud and it is um, uh, an anti-diagram in which she's proposing a, an alternative to the notion of, uh, Freud's notion of female sexuality as driven by lack. Um, and so she's using this kind of a collage transfer technique um, and her own body as a medium to subvert the use of female nude in male dominated artistic practice. Um, yeah, and it, it's one, it's an example uh, that kind of is indexed to uh, her performance work for which she's better known, but. Um, you know, similar to those performance works, uh, she is situating herself or the artist as both an image and an image maker, which is a real break uh, from the kind of history in Western art of the female model or muse and the male artist making the representations. And it's nice to see this. I've never seen this before out of the collection. So it's great. Over here, we have a um, work by Carol Itter. It's uh, the kind of the sole remaining work from a whole grouping of rattles uh, that were in a solo exhibition at Western Front. So in 1987, she did an exhibition at Western Front called Winter Garden, and there were 16 of these hanging assemblage in the exhibition space. But um, she suffered a studio fire, and this was the only one that survived um, because it was in a private collection. Uh, I was talking to Carol a couple weeks ago, and we were talking about including this in the show, and she was pleased to hear that we were gonna do that. Um, she mentioned that she worked on this piece. It was the first in these series of uh, kind of assemblage that she thought of as rattles. And she said really it was kind of the turning point because uh, she and her partner, Al Neal, were um, living for the summer in the squatter's cabin um, uh, over near Kate's Park where they lived every summer for decades and decades. And as she was constructing this figure out of these found objects and materials, Al, who was, um, primarily a musician, but also a collagist and poet, uh, came over and grabbed it and shook it to see if it was being well put together and I'll see what kind of sound it would make. And she said for her that was the catalyst for her thinking about them as rattles and as potentially percussion instruments, although we don't want people <laughs> to try that out today. So let's go this way. So I mentioned earlier this uh, 
I mentioned earlier that uh, in the process of preparing the exhibition, there was a lot of buzz in the community about looking at the legacy of Helen's, Helen Goodwin's work. And uh, so the person who came forward was Rhoda Rosenfeld, and she um, is a photographer and poet and uh, re relocated in the late 60s to Vancouver from Montreal. Um, and uh, she came forward and said that she had taken these series of photographs of a, um, a piece by Helen Goodwin in 1971 uh, called Environmental Opera. And this was the moment when both the company, dance company, and uh, Intermedia were in the process of winding down or it had just wound down. And uh, Helen was continuing to choreograph and organize these elaborate um, uh, kinds of performance works. So this series um, uh, that documents the, this performance down on the beach, very close to here, but it also responds to it in a really interesting way. Um, Rhoda's work was, um, prior to this, uh, a much more straight ahead kind of documentary um, process. And uh, when she moved to the West Coast, her work started to shift into using the camera in a more embodied way, in a more immersive way, using these kind of timed exposures or um, experimental ways of looking and thinking uh, with the camera. And I think in the context of this, this performance down on the beach, which was also on solstice uh, in 1971, you can see uh, thinking of the camera as, as a, almost a, in a prosthetic relationship to the body uh, and uh, to respond to this artwork in this very immersive way that kind of dissolves the um, distinction between the performer, the audience, the documentarian, and the environment itself. Um, I hope we're going to have better weather tomorrow, <laughs> but um, it really did create some very beautiful silhouettes of those environmental conditions. So let's have a look around the corner here. Um, the vacuum cleaner is not part of the work. So this work might be familiar to a lot of you. Um, the, this is work by Kate Craig, and uh, this is a uh, this video piece is film transferred to video um, from uh, 1974. We were having a long conversation, Jan and I, about the the the, the uh, actual date of this work, but I think we. We've ascertained that it was 1974. And this film documents a performance by Kate Craig in 1971, or four, as she basically flew out of her identity as Lady Brute. It was shot at Kate's Park, so very close to the place where Carol Itter made the rattle piece over there. And um, it was uh, shot by her then husband, Hank Bull. And he assembled the, the video together from the original double A Super 8 and 16 millimeter film. This is a ridiculously dangerous thing to do, <laughs> just to use this block and tack this tackle and cable and uh, and propel yourself face first across this <laughs> rock beach. So was this the last piece that she made as a fruit? That was the general idea, yeah. So um, uh, about Lady Fruit, so Kate Craig was a founder of Western Front, one of Vancouver's first artist from centers. And she was a pioneer in uh, performance and video art in Canada. Uh, her first husband, Eric Metcalf, and she uh, had an artistic partnership 
and they would adopt the alter egos of Doctor and Lady Brute. Um, and there was a number of works that they collaborated on or worked on separately and then would present together. Um, and so uh, Kate made this flying leopard costume from this existing leopard hat with the ears and a full length uh, body suit, this harness, and then these two enameled uh, card wings. Uh, and they are actually, the wings are in the shape of, you can see that they're sort of like hands. Um, so they refer to the hand of the spirit that is a motif that you'll see um, in Toronto, the Toronto Art Collective uh, general idea. Uh, they have a number of works that have that shape, um, as well as Image Bank. Um, and it was a, uh, uh, the idea of the hand of the spirit was this um, idea of the invisible hand, and uh, it was used in multiple contexts. It's sort of like, again, it takes on different meanings in different contexts. So here Kate is using it um, uh, to suggest these kind of like diabolical uh, wings for Lady Brute. Okay, so maybe we'll look at Evan Stevens' work right now, and this is uh, where the performance will uh, start from tomorrow, Thursday. Thursday. Oh yeah, it's happening. <laughs> mostly, it's mostly happening. <laughs> so this is uh, Evan Stevens' work, uh, plus the company minus Helen Goodwin. Uh, and it was one of the commissions for this exhibition. Um, in the process of making the work, she uh, did a lot of research uh, to essentially seek out or try to seek out the um, choreographic and gestural vocabulary of Helen's choreographic work. Uh, so she interviewed a number of uh, dancers who performed in her pieces and uh, colleagues of Helen's, one of whom is Anne Gann, and um, this is an um, shot in performance on Hornby Island. And uh, throughout this channel of the three-channel installation, uh, well, actually, you see Anne and the artist uh, over on this channel as well, this panel. So the process for the Hornby shoot was uh, very much Evan following the lead, improvisational lead of Anne Gann, and uh, interacting with the natural environment of the beach at Hornby. Um, so you see these two channels reflecting one another, uh, but how it's edited, it uh, will skip from place and location across the three channels. Uh, so now what you're seeing here and on the small monitor inside is a shoot that happened uh, at Spanish Bank with uh, a number of dance colleagues so uh, James Nam and Vanessa Goodman, I believe, are the primary choreographers working with Evan. Yeah, that's right. James Nam and Vanessa Goodman uh, working on the improvisational choreography and uh, with this group of dancers. Um, having watched and, uh, and worked face to face with Anne Gam, then these uh, younger dancers are responding to all of the material that has been gathered about Helen and uh, about uh, memories of her to create this improvisational performance on the beach. It's the same dancers, more or less, that will be here um, on Thursday for the 6.30 performance. Okay. Can you talk about 
Oh yeah, like because I've just looked right past the fact that there's this amazing geodesic dome in this thing. So thank you, Lori, I appreciate that. Uh, so this geodesic dome was um, was constructed, um, kind of designed and constructed by Keith Doyle and Joseph Friedrich. And um, the dome, the geodesic dome, of course, is a really important uh, and iconic structure in 1960s and 70s Vancouver art world. Uh, there was a series of exhibitions at the Vancouver Art Gallery called, uh, there was one big exhibition called the Dome Show and then a series of performances uh, and interactions within geodesic domes took place, anything from poetry readings to music recitals to dance performances. And Helen uh, Goodwin did uh, choreograph a number of works to happen within domes. Uh, beyond the confines of the gallery, there were also dome uh, installations on beaches and parks, um, uh, kind of in the intertidal zone that seems to be such a part of these, these ideas. And then, of course, thinking back, geodesic domes were um, uh, were um, part of the um, building vocabulary of Buckminster Fuller, who uh, and thought of as this utopian structure that is uh, very easy to put together and to take apart and to adapt to different. Um, uh, environmental and initial contexts and uh, so it has this continues to have this sort of association of uh, utopia in fact the small town where my brother lives in southeast Saskatchewan there's an artist couple that live in a dome and then there's a little studio dome as well that was built around the same era uh, which is sort of shocking when you think about what a harsh climate that is um, Similarly, there have been other dome works here at the Belkin. Um, uh, help me, Jana. It's uh, Wildflowers of Manitoba was an exhibition or piece in a show by Louis John Donick and, and Louis, Louis Jacob. It was a plastic one. It was smaller scale and had performers resting inside it um, for the duration of the show. Uh, also, Holly Ward, um, who was, uh, she, did she go to UBC? No, I don't think so. She doesn't say that. But she was in that very same exhibition, but she subsequently went on to create a, um, a geodesic dome uh, at Langara College that was on campus outdoors for a period of time, and then was relocated uh, in, in a, on a property by a private collector um, Greenchurch. Yeah, the same collectors of you know, uh, Ross Hill and uh, Jane Irwin uh, on their ranch uh, in interior British Columbia. And uh, Holly and her partner, uh, Kevin Schmidt, continue to use it and um, invite people to come out and interact with it. Anything else I forgot, Lori? <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned the beach because I was also wondering about intertidal zones and beaches and mm -hmm. how it's different performances on beaches and they're having a lake from like the rock stuff. So. Yeah, I think the beach as a site you can also see in uh, Michael Morris and Vincent Trazov did a number of installations on beaches and then photographed them and the uh, the artwork is the slide projection, the photo, like the photo image. Uh, you think it has this space of, um, of kind of a per perplexing space in terms of uh, how far the horizon line is away. It's a broad expanse, etc. Um, and then the intertidal zone itself is a very interesting space because uh, it's a it's property that it's like the the wet part of the beach is really beyond regulation in a lot of ways it's um, it, 
it, uh, it's difficult to ascertain who it really belongs to because it appears and disappears twice a day. And uh, so this intertidal zone is, um, I think, is an important concept for a lot of the work that is produced here at this time um, with a uh, focus on ecological concerns, um, new kind of ways of living and working together, uh, communal structures, um, cooperative models of organization, etc. Okay, let's go around the corner here. So facing Kate Craig's work is, uh, is this piece by Cornelia Weingarten. And uh, this is part of a much larger installation um, that Corey did. Um, which was called at face value, or she, from an exhibition uh, called Forge Sub Subjectivity from 1993. So this work is uh, unknown artist, portrait of a lady, uh, roughly circa 1950, and it's from the Belkin collection. 1850. Sorry, 1850, thank you. And um, it's from the Belkin collection, and it is an anonymous artist and an anonymous sitter. Um, and what Corey did was uh, she commissioned uh, either a student or a former student to um, replicate this portrait as if it were a woman dressed as a man. And what she's referring to here was this kind of fictional history she was putting together about uh, the member of parliament, John White, who was uh, born Eliza McCormick, as the story goes. And um, she was elected to the Canadian House of Commons in 1871 as a man and maintained the deception through 17 sessions of parliament until her death. So, um, with this work, Corey is uh, investigating the idea of anonymity as, um, as a form of disappearance uh, in, in relation to transgender issues, where someone uh, passes themselves off with a different identity. It is a kind of erasure. But that erasure also creates the space for potential subjectivities or possible identities. Um, and this, I think, you, it can be seen throughout these sort of historical uh, incidences of transgender people living their lives, um, that the space of erasure is also a space of potential. And uh, the potentials within anonymity, uh, I think, are, uh, as well as the precarity of it, um, are continue to be like a, a major interest of Corey's. Uh, Corey also had a really strong uh, artistic dialogue and relationship with Kate Craig over the years. Um, Corey was involved very, very early with Video In uh, in a kind of a similar role to Kate Craig's uh, association with Western Front. And um, so I really wanted to put these these two works in dialogue with one another, and also to bring into this uh, the idea of, of uh, we're dealing with performativity and performance and the residue performance, but also the performance of gender uh, in art and in life. Okay, let's go around the corner here. Uh, here we have a couch and chair. And this couch and chair <laughs> constitutes the reading area for the exhibition. Um, we will, it will feature the making of an archive by Jacqueline Wang Nian. Nian. Uh, and it's a fascinating new publication uh, that we are sort of featuring as part of our reading area uh, at the gallery that will be here to sweet. <laughs> Eleanor Anton is uh, also worked from this 
reflection. I'll let you go and have a close look at it. Um, it is also working with gender identity, and uh, in this photograph, there's sort of a double photograph. There's a print and a, and a postcard, so it's the original print and then a sample of multiple. Um, and the title of the, of the work is January 20, 1649. And uh, so Anton's performative photograph uh, is this kind of pastiche of the 17th century trial of King Charles I. Uh, that was a trial in which he, he was indicted for treason by High Court of Justice and subsequently executed. Um, so between 1975 and 78, Anton frequently performed hour-long improvisational monologues in Canada and the U.S. portraying his benevolent but ultimately impotent monarch. So this is an interesting notion or way of thinking about cross-dressing is to occupy the body of the impotent male or the ineffective male. Um, and uh, she often uses historical settings, allegory, mythical figures, fictional personas and alter egos to talk about the malleability of gender and, um, and identity identity formation. Uh, it's another artist working with uh, construct of gender in this particular work uh, by Jimmy Yoon. Often Jimmy Yoon's work uh, involves self-portraiture, but it's also usually a real exploration of uh, racial and uh, female gender identity. Uh, often as uh, a mother, and so with this work, which was produced recently, in the last two years, um, yeah, 2016, although it's dated 1991, 2016, because she um, looked back through her film Negative Archive and uh, to produce this work, which is called Hey You, Yeah You, Jimmy You. And it's a set of uh, silver gelatin prints that she shot in 1991 on color tuna quarter film. Um, so part of the process of remaking it was reworking of, uh, of the print process to um, render each copy ever so slightly different. And it takes a lot of concentration to notice that they are each distinct in how they were um, uh, exposed. Um, so yeah, this is exploring one of, uh, of Jim Mead's alter egos, this rugged man, who's so, sort of ambiguous in terms of a, a racial identity, uh, who's pointing the finger going, hey you, yeah you. And in that's a reference to Althusser's notion of interpolation, where the subject comes into being by having somebody acknowledge them and call them the subject, hey you, I say hey you, so therefore you exist, right? Um, and that Althusser's more broad concept proposes that social, political, and historical circumstances produce subjects who were always already implicated in these institutional structures of identity formation rather than being self-produced. So uh, as much as we talk about the um, the uh, formation, the conscious and active um, formation of our own identities or um, our fulfillment as individuals. Uh, Althusser's position is that um, we uh, are already, always already uh, formed, our identities formed in relation to institutional structures and the uh, and society's uh, massive collective effort of keeping those institutional structures in place. Um, yeah. Now this work uh, kind of combines a documentation of a, a performance as well as this, the detritus left behind. This is um, Walter Marchetti, who um, 
is that he's an avant-garde composer, was an avant-garde composer, European, and um, who has collaborated with John Cage uh, along with Spanish composer Juan Hidalgo. And um, this was a document of a performance that he did here at the Belkin. Um, he performed chamber music number 293 at the Belkin in 1999 as part of the exhibition Walter Marchetti and Zaj invita Invitations from the Kenneth Coot Smith Archive. In this piece, the artist lay on the floor between these two blankets for the duration of the opening, which was about three hours long. And um, so we liked the I I very much like the idea of of um, sleeping Walter and kind of imagine the rest of the exhibition as his dream. So this is the second um, commission of Ailey exhibition. Uh, this is a work by Michael de Courcy calling, called Looking at the Source, and it's the kind of most recent uh, work by Michael that looks at the artistic community formed around Intermedia. And um, I'm just going to quote Michael here uh, because this is his description of the group. The idea of creating a society and a public workshop dedicated to the collaborative exploration of new technologies by artists have been the brainchild of a local alliance of artists, poets, musicians, dancers, and academics. This group originally assembled to discuss Marshall McLuhan's theories of how electronic media, particularly television, was transforming our world into a global village. There was a strong feeling that artists should be at the vanguard of this radical reshaping of society. So with this work, um, Michael is looking in particular at a performance piece. Well, it's not exactly true. What we have here is a sculptural object that uh, includes sound, and uh, it is a reference to the documentation of the crowds. So yeah, the, uh, this work relates to this photographs and this um, uh, media presentation that is using a kind of mobile camera to explore these like archival images, almost kind of trying to um, uh, extract additional meaning the documentary image. And then there's three channels of audio. So uh, these are interviews that Michael conducted over the years with a number of people in the Vancouver community uh, talking about Helen Goodwin and her influence on the artistic practice of that era. Okay, let's gather back over here. So, any questions at this point? I always count on you, Laurie, for a question or two. You have an observation about your curatorial decision to handle the walls? Yep. Like that, and how that is reminiscent of the triangles on the geodesic dome. Exactly. And also how that makes radial spokes yep. in the central points. So, the kind of like mm -hmm. material shape of the exhibition reflected in the Oh, and also yeah. the fact that that piece is very huge at the center of the exhibition. Yeah. No, thank you. Yeah, those were definitely thoughts that I was having. <laughs> and uh, I think also because we've been thinking about this idea of, um, you know, what's the project of bringing someone back into view? Um, I mean, often there's like, you know, newly rediscovered or <laughs> someone whose practice had, had fallen into obscurity and is pulled back into view. Um, but I think both of these artists that, uh, that were commissioned have a really um, 
you know, Kate made it a much more uh, rich and detailed and also uh, contradictory and problematized um, process of looking at difficult histories. I think perhaps one of the reasons why, um, and it's explored in, in uh, Michael's work, one of the reasons why Helen's influence or that she was spoke, she was spoken about by people less and less and less and less had to do with the nature of her death. And so uh, because she died as suicide, she walked into the water and drowned herself. That reticence for people to talk about suicide probably as much as the fact that dance is an ephemeral form of art and is not often well documented and the fact that she was one of the few women of you know working really consistently with the intermediate group um, had to do with her movement from the center of the community to a uh, status at the margin and so it's about Helen, but it's also about how do we construct histories? How do we construct art histories? How do we keep them alive? Uh, how do you gauge someone's production over their life? Um, how do you think about influence and uh, as opposed to, you know, according to Western canon, uh, an idea of, of a linear narrative of important art makers. How do you look at, and, and because, hugely because this era of art practice was one in which the idea of authorship was being challenged. Uh, the uh, people were working collaboratively. They were working with media that weren't considered high art media, like handheld video, they were uh, breaking down or dissolving boundaries between the disciplines of printmaking and painting and film and photography. So how do we as artists, art historians, curators think about those histories and try and reformulate them in more complex and interesting ways? And that, my friends, <laughs> is four o'clock. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. There's also this really interesting.